Namaste, Vanakam, and hello to everyone. My name is Akshay Sivaraman, and I welcome you to Bharat Vata's 75th Indian Independence Day special episode. We Indians have always been proud of our Indian civilization, culture, and Dharmic values. Then again, a part of our nation has also been enticed by the seemingly progressive liberal American society. While our culture seems largely intact today, the ideologies our educated youth import from the West will hugely impact how our societies evolve. And that is why it is crucial to understand where our ideas come from. To discuss this, we have with us the editor of the club, Gurmurti Ji, a deep thinker and philosopher who has been observing how ideologies evolve all around the world and what effects they have on one another. Anakam Gurmurti Aya, I'm thrilled and honored to have you here. So I'm going to begin with this question, Gurmurti Ji. Are we rooted in our civilization, tradition, and our history? Or has there been a change over the years? See, being rooted doesn't mean there will be no change. No human society can be frozen into the past or the present. Continuity and change has been the hallmark of Indian civilization. So, being rooted doesn't mean there is no change. Swami Vivekananda said that if Vedavyasa came and walked across this country, he will find many things which he witnessed then being present now, even though a huge amount of changes may have taken place. So, when you have a philosophy, you always permit change. Because the philosophy is allows you to consider the other person's viewpoint also as a possible, uh, possibly correct. Only in an ideology, you presume you are right, the other person is wrong. Okay. In India, there has never been an ideology throughout. Its history has been a history of philosophy. Okay. Um, that's wonderful. So we uh, love uh, change uh, in our- We allow change. Yes, there is no do. one to stop change. There is no one to permit change. Change takes place. All right. Then my next question for you would be, right now, um, we are heavily influenced by the Western thoughts. So what are your thoughts about that? Is that okay to allow uh, uh, their thoughts to influence us? You see, that the Western thoughts influenced us is partly true and partly not true because 300 years of colonization could not change India. Despite the fact they were the ruling masters, hmm. 700 years of Muslim rule could not change India fundamentally. India was changing and they may even have contributed to the change. So, to say that we are influenced by uh, events, things, thoughts from outside is only one-sided uh, understanding of the situation. We have also influenced the world. How is yoga influencing the world? How is spiritualism influencing the world? How is the idea that all religions uh, need to work with each other? A thought which was generated only in this country being accepted everywhere. Hmm. Diversity of life, diversity of thought, diversity of uh, uh, ecological and environmental situation, which is a great contribution of Indian thought, is today a global thought. If Indians do not articulate as well as they should, that they are also influencing the world, it is the fault of Indians and not Indian thought. Oh. So my view is, the world is also being influenced by India, but the Indians are unaware, particularly English educated Indians are unaware that they are influencing the world. So, if you look at many Indologists, 
whether it is arnold toynbee or uh, will durant they have said india is the country civilization its spiritualism its way of life its culture is the only thing which is going to save the world they are all mighty historians two greatest historians said this about india most indians do not know about it, it is the fault of indians it is not the fault of indian thought so no. i am not agreeing for the moment that the indians are heavily influenced from outside my view is despite the fact that uh, we had lost our political sovereignty for almost a millennium we have never lost our influence over ourselves though we have tried to understand what is good in other civilizations and try to internalize it in our civilization also yoga being adopted by the west is probably a reason why we also have started like uh, celebrating yoga that is that will be my point of view our uh, the educated global minded youth uh, of india today tend to think that modernity means progress and traditional india thoughts are a little backward superstitious and rituals so this is the critique put forth by the educated global minded youths of india today though i have met many educated youths many highly global minded youths they are a confused lot i don't think they are very clear that modernity means progress modernity means no relationship modernity means sexual freedom modernity means no religion modernity means no tradition modernity means no respect for parents modernity means no respect for women modernity means no affection for children modernity means no family bondage do they know it hmm what is progress a converting a relation based to society into a contract based to society is it modernity they just don't know what is modernity the very idea of modernity is getting redefined in hmm. fact the latest trends about modernity after asia began rising in the rising in the third millennium is that each country has its own there are multiple modernities there is nothing called a west centric modernity today in fact the west centric modernity has landed the west in such serious difficulty other countries have begun to recognize it our country may not be able to explicitly speak it out because those who articulate our view point being english educated people who basically lack confidence about the country they lack confidence in themselves otherwise 40 crore people will not be going to kumbh mela and many educated people go there and company executives go there industrialists go there but they don't assert it because they lack the confidence hmm so i don't believe that this global minded english educated people think like this modernity is progress they don't know what is modernity they think speaking in english is modernity or wearing half dress is modernity or uh, a woman having the right to show her different parts is modernity i mean these are all idiotic you may wear what you like but you can't say it is modernity you like it that's all so i don't think that uh, modernity in the sense in which you talk is progressive you like it you do it that's it but yeah, you may come to a situation where this is useless and become something different also this also i see people who are in their 20s like this in their 40s they are totally different because the ecosystem is like that hmm. the national ecosystem our culture our values our traditions our morals even though people move around and completely digress they come around and in their 40s they are entirely different that's an interesting uh, perspective gurumurthy ji so i would like to ask you the youth is enticed by the ideas of modernity but you do say after a certain period of time the people come around what makes people come around to the roots of our uh, indian tradition because they, they what they understand as modernity is not progressive they understand it you see the kind of educational system that we have the media that we have the west centric discourse that we have are confused and are continuing to confuse uh, the youth 
previously the entire country was in a kind of confusion but mm. it is the country is not in confusion the country is having proper direction the media may be confused the uh, political system may be confused uh, the youth may be confused the academic may be confused the intellectuals may be confused the country is not confused in fact there is a conflict between what this country is and what these specific groups of people are so you can't say the country is confused you can say these people are confused when they feel <laughs> that they are foolish they are returning back to the roots okay so where is the question of judging the country by them you have to judge them by the country oh that's beautiful gurumurthy ji but uh, wouldn't it take just a few generations for that to flip where the the country is uh, in more and more influenced by what a small population of the segment today is influenced by actually this small section is being digested it is not seven generations it is five generations is not me it was like that the colonies raised just five six generation of people who would have no respect for india but from within the group only the people who fought for freedom came Hmm. Because when they found that your education system is morphing you into a very different person away from your soul, that self-realization produced the freedom movement. The freedom movement was generated by people who were educated in the colonial education system. Okay. So it it is when you move away, the ecosystem brings you back. Because India is too vast, too diverse, too attractive. to compelling a civilization for you to move away that is marxism has tested india and failed atheism has tested india and failed westernization tested india and has failed actually take tamil nadu tamil nadu was completely swayed to uh Uh, this atheistic dravidian separatist philosophy today the number of atheists in tamil nadu according to the 2011 census is 1296 wow. so the, the civilization absorbs people back these idiots go and come back one one aspect of the educated elites i want to talk about is the fight for the soil of the abroad the top the talent the top talent always leaves the country and uh, with that the culture also leaves is the fear that i have i don't know the fear let them go we have enough number of people to export and let them get deserted we have enough number of people to rebuild india okay uh but that is the case today because the majority of our population are in our in the rural areas of the country increasingly the talent in the rural uh, is migrating to the urban which is increasingly getting westernized and then it's a chain reaction people leave the rural areas and then go to the cities and then from that go to the abroad isn't that like an isn't that a progression like won't that only increase over time these are all the assumptions you would uh, accept that uh, bombay is like any uh, modern western city for the ganpati function the entire bombay comes on the road whether it is cinema stars whether it is highly educated professors or you can see everybody so the cultural identity is not going to be independent of a person's individual opinion he is part of the whole so to say that you know these people are urban people means they are different this is completely wrong actually the urban rural link many people do not know every urban person is linked to the rural areas he hmm. sends money to the rural areas he comes back for deepavali to rural areas you see uh, the number of people traveling from towns to villages when there is pongal when there is uh, deepavali when there is any function is unbelievable so how do you say there is an urban and rural divide in india because this is all uh, our little intellectuals saying india is getting urbanized nothing is getting urbanized there is a 
continuous linkage among people. There is relationship, there is caste, there is community, there is family, there is religion. Which, you see, in the West, when urban rural divide took place by industrialization, there was no relationship among people to link them. But in India, there is, in, uh, in, in uh, New York, you will find the Nagaratar community advertising that we want a Nagaratar girl from India. Nobody, nobody thinks of we are something different. We are, I mean, whether it is Tamil speaking or uh, caste or community or I want to play girl from Tanjur. I want a boy from Tanjur. This kind of relationship is unthinkable in atomized West. So Indian society can never be atomized according to. Because the cross currents are so intense, so strong, so compellingly one. You cannot atomize the Indian society. That is uh, interesting, but see, I, I went... No, it's truth. It's not just interesting. All right. Okay. But the there is a little bit of fascination for the newfound freedom. The individualistic thought is very appealing. Some, some, some of us kind of want to be left alone, like, just let me be, let me do what I want. Don't explain. Me... You are not universal. You are not going to be the example. You can. There, are, there have been many vagabonds in our own civilization. There have been men, men women, vagabonds. We have accepted them. In fact, Bahuka spoke about it 5,000 years ago. Um... And so we, they are not examples. They will be there. But once their ego is demolished, hmm. once their pride is demolished, once their arrogance is demolished, then they will be all right. Okay. Individualism is nothing but arrogance. To be individualistic in thinking doesn't mean that you have to be disrespecting your parents or disrespecting your neighbor or disrespecting an uneducated person. Consider somebody as illiterate. If somebody doesn't speak English, he is not good enough. You see, these are all your arrogance. So, actually arrogance makes an individual feel superior. If an individual is not arrogant, he will still be an individual and humble. Uh, what are your thoughts about our Indian tradition, which protects people from getting too proud and arrogant, Ramutiji. Relationship first. Respect for parents. Okay. Respect for elders. Respect for a teacher. Mm -hmm. Respect for women. These are all the humbling factors. If you leave all this, you become arrogant. It has nothing to do with freedom of thinking. Freedom of thinking is different from disrespecting people. You think I am independent because I have nothing to do with my parents. This is not the kind of individualism. You see, we have produced the greatest thinkers. Was Shankara not a great thinker? Vivekananda not a great thinker? Ramakrishna Paramahansa not a great thinker? Raman Maharishi not a great thinker? They were all great thinkers. But they never disowned the traditional respect for teachers, for parents, for women. So, your norms for deciding what is individualism is wrong. Hmm. Disowning others is individualism means that you have something seriously wrong with your brain. I'm not even talking about mind. I'm talking about brain. Uh, but increasingly with um, the, the entertainment industry, for example, is a major influence that imports a lot of cool cultural elements from the West, which is more individualistic and atomized. And uh, slowly, but slowly we cannot uh, uh, discard the influence those elements have on us. So is that a concern? There is a self-correcting mechanism. You people do not know because you look at only... Uh, what is happening today. I look at what happened in the last 50 years. 
for example take uh, uh, in 1965 66 67 in that period when i came to madras city from uh, my village the pictures that were was paris by night london by night these were all the pictures running in uh, city theaters so ap nagarajan saw this and he found many respectable family girls boys are seeing these films and in late night shows so he took a series of films thirulayadal and things like that this completely changed to the discourse this completely changed to the discourse afterwards the film became the correcting mechanism films are just instruments just like a television what you put in that is important so jay santoshi ma came in the north and completely changed the course of uh, uh, hindi films so it depends upon ultimately even the filmmakers cannot ignore what the people want if particular people go to uh, kumbha mela in the modern times so called modern times and the water is not too good and in that you want to have baths the people the uh, filmmakers also know what the people want so i am not of the view that films will destroy indian culture film can also fertilize indian culture one ramayana and mahabharata in the in the television completely changed in india and 100 films with the nude women have not changed in india that's a beautiful yes that is true um now uh from the climate change to now the covid pandemic right which increasingly appears to have uh, emerged from virology labs the human kind is illustrating the sheer hubris that we could control the nature how do we avoid that kind of technological arrogance see we have a philosophy says isa wasan idam sarvam that is divinity has manifested as the universe whether it is the animate or inanimate in fact the west looked at only the physical appearance and said this is animate and inanimate our people said everything is atom hmm so everything down to the tiniest atom is the manifestation of god and that is why people who believe in it how do they you know we will not in our village we will not cut a tree when somebody has conceived in our house my house which has been built the house in which i live there was a neem tree almost in the center of uh, the plot we built the entire house around that and lost maybe 15 100 square feet area we were a big joint family we needed every inch of the house but we could not cut the tree this that is what has made india even today it's such a large population it's just a small place india is just 2% of world's uh, physical uh, geographic area we have 18% of the world's population we are home to 7% of natural resources and biological creation we have the largest cattle population in india because our uh, meat consumption is one of the lowest in the world we just consume our per capita meat consumption is just 5% when the west consumes 120 130 180 kilos so it is this culture which is now showing how west is talking about no meat situation tell me where did they get this idea from they didn't get this idea because it is a virtue they think it is a necessity in paris convention in 2015 they wanted one week day to be meat free day of course the meat manufacturers would not allow it for us it is natural mm. in fact i don't know whether you heard about one kejrali in the 16th century uh, 15th century in rajasthan from where the chipko movement came 
women in india are prohibited from seeing a tree being cut so in in kejrali women always protected the tree so the king sent uh, his army to cut trees for refurbishing his palace a woman said no you cannot cut the tree uh, then she said we will cut you then he cut the woman 363 people died to protect the tree this the world does not know it is history so we are talking about the environment you can never protect the environment unless you are going to reduce your wants and you will not reduce your wants because science tells you to reduce your wants your faith your sentiments your value systems your lifestyle which is born out of this should acculture you to this intellectually you may be convinced that mm. you should not cut tree but you will want plywood you want furnished house so the conflict will arise outside the brain because you have no value system we have the value system and this you have to export unless you are convinced this is modern actually worshiping tree is modern you think dressing is modern speaking in english is modern no preventing tree being cut is modern worshiping tree is modern you will call it animistic you will dismiss it as tribalistic so that is modern this is how the indian intellectuals must be speaking about india indian philosophy indian value system indian lifestyle if you don't speak about it the fault is not with india the fault is with you uh, i got beautiful beautiful lovely so it is independence day and uh, the very representation of our nation is bharat mata a young woman so on behalf of young women like me i ask what does this imagery represent that they should be getting out of your confusion because many educated women particularly many educated girls are confused about this they think they have wrong ideas about tradition wrong ideas about modernity wrong ideas about our social milieu hmm the fault is with them not with bharat mata Hmm. you put bharat mata in pant without uh bindi cut hair with a half half cut slack will you call it bharat mata hmm your concept of bharat mata is different but your concept of life is entirely on the opposite side that's wrong but you cannot internalize that bharat mata so what message would you like to give uh, to young women folk uh, if there's one thing we want to we should remember all the times you know this message is what uh, maharishi arabindo got when he came back to when he came to pondicherry he tested with the western ideas then he tested with the revolutionary ideas he became a revolutionary and then he came back to pondicherry he was a great intellectual at the age of 6 he was sent abroad by his parents so that he doesn't live in a third country mm. and so he came as a towering intellectual one of the finest minds india produced and uh, everybody was looking at maharishi arabindo to show away maharishi arabindo was looking to one kullachami who was a mystic he thought he was going to show him the way so everybody thought arvind was gone mad he is he is a illiterate mystic he is going to show way to arvind on kullachami subramanya bharati has written poems so one day arvind was sitting and having a cup of tea with his friends kullachami came and lifted the tea cup in front of marish arvind emptied the tea cup and placed the tea cup before him and went away Arvind sir i have got the message his friends said you lost the tea please tell us what message you have got 
He said he has told me to empty my thoughts and begin thinking afresh. This will be my advice to the confused youths: empty your thoughts and begin thinking afresh. I'd like to ask a question about the press freedom in India. People often on the social media say there is no freedom of expression. What is your comment on that? See, I have been with the media for the last forty-five years. If there is any time when we did not have freedom of press because of government action it was only during the emergency when the government completely stopped the press after 1972 there is no freedom of press in india because press became so money minded hmm. the journalists became lost to their mission they began building properties media began selling its space even for news so where is freedom of press so the, to talk about freedom of press in india is to talk about something which doesn't exist in the press first hmm. why talk about the government today you don't need when you have social media you don't even need mainline media to 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 express your ideas so where is the question of freedom of expression being lacking the media lacks freedom it is not the government denies freedom no government can deny leave us in narendra modi government somebody else come no government can deny so this whole thing is a western conspiracy to they say india there is no freedom of press unless you abuse hindus it is no freedom now you cannot abuse the hindus because the hindus are reacting previously they were listening now when the hindus are reacting freedom of press is lost the government has nothing to do with it lovely lovely thank you so much gurumurthy ji you have given clarity on a lot of thoughts that uh, seem to be prevalent across the youth especially of india and thank you so much for providing valuable thoughts and uh, thank you for the time we are very much thrilled to have you thank you so much thank you for tuning in to this episode of the bharat vartha podcast if you want to see more content like this then don't forget to subscribe to our channel we started bharat vartha to facilitate long form discussions on politics policy and culture we don't necessarily endorse anything that was said in this episode if you wish to offer us feedback do reach out to us on social media we are at bharat vartha on facebook twitter and instagram you could also get in touch with us on our website www.bharatvartha.in the links are in the description below until next time stay safe take care and jai